Kamima. Alô? Oh, que, que espetáculo, hein? Parabéns, uma salva de palmas mais uma vez. Um ótimo dia a todos vocês, sejam todos muitíssimo bem-vindos à nona edição do Cenário das Doenças Raras no Brasil. A minha é Camila Surouge, eu sou jornalista, apresentadora e tenho o um imenso prazer de conduzir esse evento pelo quinto ano consecutivo. Antes de fazer minha apresentação, eu gostaria de agradecer ao bailarino profissional Luan Ratacaso, professor, coreógrafo e produtor cultural há 15 anos. Ele já foi premiado em diversos festivais nacionais e aí o Luan já recebeu prêmios e bolsas de estudo para o exterior, como BDC e Steps on Broadway, nos Estados Unidos, e de outras renomadas escolas de países europeus. Muitíssimo obrigada, Luan, por dar vida à nova campanha da Casa Hunter, que fala um pouco da vocação da instituição em buscar respostas e fornecer o abrigo a todo raro que procura ajuda. Mais uma vez, uma salva de palmas para o Luan, gente. Agora sim, antes de iniciar oficialmente a nossa apresentação de hoje, eu gostaria de fazer minha audiodescrição. Eu sou uma mulher branca, de 39 anos, 1,63m, cabelos castanhos, com luzes loiras. Meu cabelo está preso só em uma das laterais. Eu tenho um vestido verde. Blonde, fish dark hair. I wear a green dress and high heels. I'm in front of a screen with the logo of the ninth century of rare disease in Brazil. So I'd like to invite you and those who follow us on the internet to listen, rethink, and propose new health alternatives for patients with rare disease and their caretakers. Yes, you patient, healthcare professional, administrator, Congress member, pharmaceutical professional, researcher, everyone involved in the chain. The event is made by and for everyone. On behalf of Casa Hunter, I'd like to thank you all for your presence. Once again, we have the joy of counting on people from different Brazilian states and also different countries. We have 13 different nations. Uh, before Brazil, we have people from Afghanistan, Angola, Argentina, Belgium, Bolivia, Colombia, Arab Emirates, United States, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and United Kingdom. A lot of people here. Welcome to everyone who are with us and online. In so that an increasing number of people can participate. This content has been simultaneously transmitted into English, Spanish, and the Brazilian Sign Language. The challenge of holding an event like this is only possible with the help of many people. And for that, uh, we want to thank our sponsors and supporters. So let's go to this list, which is getting longer. Thank you so much to the Secretariat for people with disability of the city of Sao Paulo, the Brazilian Association of Hematology, Hemotherapy and Cell Therapy, the Brazilian Association of Lymphoma and Leukemia, Brazilian Thalassemia Association to the Brazilian Congress of Audit in Health System, the Brazilian Institute for Responsible Action, the Genetic Sex for All Institute, Jo Clemente Institute, House of Hairs, and the Brazilian Federation of Rare Disease Associations, Pebra Haras. And also to our sponsors, Beringen Ingelheim, Multicare, Roche, Amgen, AstraZeneca, GSK, Johnson & Johnson, Novartis, Pfizer, PTC, Sanofi, Bayer, Biogen, Kesey, Eurofarma, Illumina, Ipsen, MSD, Takeda, Tiva, On Island, Azafras, Biomarine, Entrails, JCR, Novo Nordisk, Orchard, Ricordati, Ultragenics, and Verdex. We thank you so much for your support, and especially to our patients, to whom we dedicate another edition. And many of you might know, Casa Hunter has a deep relationship with the state of Rio Grande do Sul. There, we have our largest project, Casa dos Raros, the first integrated and multidisciplinary treatment center for people with rare disease and their caregivers. We cannot start this event without showing our solidarity and care for our gauchos and all Brazilians who have dedicated to, uh, their lives to rebuilding this state.
e assim emocionados And without we call to officially open the activities of the ninth edition of the scenario priorities in Brazil and to Andar, the starting point of this journey. Come here, Tony, to welcome everyone who's going to participate in this event. Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, the presence of all my friends here who crossed states and oceans to be with us today, and especially our the authorities present present here today. is a great is with great joy that we are again together to discuss challenges and achievements in the scenario of rare disease in Brazil. Here we have all stakeholders represented, academia, health professionals, academia, the executive, the legislative, industry, researchers, patients associations, a broad and diverse group of people who has at least one common challenge to build the new ec ecosystem in health. Our task is very hard, but initiatives like uh, Casa dos Raros in Porto Alegre, now one year old, show us that it's possible. We have a sum of efforts associated with the political uh, will and uh, choice for, uh, for to make policies and the love of our caretakers. So I'd like to take a look at the content prepared for this meeting and encourage all of you to take a uh, seat on our tables. We have the, an honor to have very special and unbelievable guests with a lot of experience in the, in the topic and who are fighting for rare disease patients. Together, we are here to build answers, opening a path that will turn the first hospital for rare disease into reality, an integrated center for patients and their family members. So thank you so much to all of you, all of you and enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Tony. This is a journey that excites us and encourages us. So before we start, we have some special thanks to our friends from Paraná who came here to be take part of this scenario. That's what I like, this sort of excitement. An applause, a hand of applause to them. Our health professionals, special education, the Secretariat of Health and the Paraná Secretariat for Rare Disease our group from the University of Brasilia, making some noise here today, um, people from the academia, academia students, uh, patients and caregivers. And we also have a, our special guest, the mayor of Horizonte for, and we would like to thank you for the land provided from uh, the city to build a new Casa dos Raros. So it's an honor to have the partnership with the Institute of Management and, and Citizenship that work in management, in public health, to create the CDR North and, North and Northeast, the state of Sierra. So thank you so much. I'd like to tell you that we have a lot of them, so be prepared, because Casa Hunter, as you know, uh, launched um, few uh, short movies about rare disease and in the, the, the most uh, watched channel in the country. It was a series that won three awards, one for audiovisual, the Zoff Luzophone Award, the Critics Award, and for public education. Now, what is the news? We're back here today with our second season and is going to be launched on June 
31st. And for you who are at Chats with WTC here on the internet, we have a spoiler. I love a spoiler. And Tony, are you ready? Are you ready to see to see the second season of Living is Rare? Are you ready? Tell me, are you ready? Okay, let's run the VT so you can see the the, the shorts. I have a rare disease. Why am I going to study? Why am I going to graduate? Why am I going to try to build a family? You expect everything, but not a rare disease. I haven't accepted that yet, but just the fact that there's no cure. The doctor, uh, when he came with the diagnosis, he said that he might not reach one year old. I'm Brian, I'm eight years old, and I'm participating in a series, uh, in the series Vivere Haru, Living is Rare at Global Play. How can I broke this barrier? What is on my reach? If you have life, there's a way. We don't give up, apply, just carry on. I have no privilege. I have to strive. My diagnostic doesn't define us. Your diagnosis doesn't define you. I have the disease, but I'm not the disease. We get the diagnostic and we can do whatever we want. But I choose to leave. When I think about giving up, I really think Brian wouldn't do that. That's his mission. He would figure out a way. And besides the spoiler, I have an awesome news to you. We have three of the protagonists here, Andrea, Brian, and Regina. Who are, where are you guys? An applause to three of our protagonists. Look at Brian is over there. Brian, let people know where you are. Wow. Let's Brian. Let's Brian. Any other representative from Global Play? Yes, another applause here from Global Play, the Brazilian streaming channel. The best known Brazilian streaming channel. Now, let's. You're going to put the stage because you're going to see some people here on the stage. But I'd like to, to let you know that I really feel touched to receive each one of you here. It's important to share the stories. Tony, can I ask you to come to the stage? Because I'll listen what you have to say. Tony, can you come back to the stage? And I know that Tony is going to be here with me for a while. You're going to work, Tony. Fernanda will be here soon. We're going to call her as well. Tony, welcome again. First, I'd like to know the first season is over did you expect such success no not in, not in no not really in the beginning it was a huge challenge it was something new working with production with cinema documentary that needs to show everything so those who watch the documentary can really see the journey of a patient in less than 30 minutes. So it was beyond our expectations. We are all so proud. And I'd like to thank you, all of our sponsors of Living is Rare, because like, thanks to them, that's a reality. And we're starting to launch the, the third season for next year. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. We need to have, actually, we want to have more than 100 documentaries on streaming so all patients and families can have a free access and understand better the, better the patient's journey. Patients who are 
with them all the time. So I've heard that the second season, not only the subtitles, you're going to have translation into Spanish and English, right? Yes, last year, the first season only had uh, English translation. Now, not only English, you're gonna, it's going to be translated into Spanish. So all countries in Latin America uh, and Spain can watch the series and understand. Not only that, but uh, I think it was sold to one of the, the countries. I think it was Mongolia. Mongolia just bought the series and other countries are negotiating as well this um, series living is rare be very hard to show that brazil can have everything we can do it we export awareness we export training we export technology we can be leaders in rare disease thank you tony i'd like to thank the co-production with Vibrant, Cine Group, and Terno Valley. So thank you so much for helping uh, this series to, uh, to happen. We're going to have more seasons, right? The third season soon will be launched. Uh, it's supposed to be launched at the beginning of 2025. So of course, it's not easy. It's not easy to prepare seven documentaries per year, but you want to have at least seven documentaries a year for the next 10 years to have at least 70 to 100 documentaries on rare disease so if you can stay here with me we're going to start our works today so don't forget on the 31st of july we have a meeting at global play you don't need to be um, it's an open, open contact. You don't, don't need to subscribe for the channel. And you're going to listen to some awesome stories about our patient. You're going to see them on the small screen, on the little big screen. Did you like to see yourself on the screen, Brian? Great. Now, before we uh, carry on, here's a bag that you've received with the badge. We have many materials here, so you can find data on rare disease. There is a very interesting folder about Casa dos Harus, and we have the scenario uh, program, the, the agenda. So if you scan this QR, this QR code, you can send your questions, and we're going to ask the questions to our guests. So you can just click or 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 or. or yeah, you know how the QR code used. So, and with that, we can send us your questions. So, who are online with us? So be careful, you're on traffic. You just have to click on there's a transmission chat, and you can send the question right there, right away. Very easy, straightforward. Now, let's start with the opening of the ninth edition of the scenario of rare disease in Brazil. So, Tony is here. You're going to receive some of the authorities present in this meeting. I would like to invite to the stage Mrs. Dica Vidal, uh, City Secretary, Secretary of People with Rare Disease. She's represented uh, Mayor, Mayor Nunes. Nathan Monsores, the coordinator of Monsores, the general coordinator of rare diseases and the Ministry of Health. Dica Vidal our Secretary of Persons with Disability, Mrs. Ana Paula Nedavasca, Executive Secretary for People with Disability Rights in the State of Sao Paulo, Mrs. Marisi Sarpa, Deputy Secretary of the Municipal, Municipal Health Department in representing Mrs. Uh, I'm sorry, I have represented Mr. Luis Carlos Samargo, the Health Secretary of the City of Sao Paulo, Mrs. Flavia Moraes, Congress, state Congress person of uh, the state of Goiás, Maria Rosa, the Congress woman for the state of São Paulo. It's a, the, it's a Congress woman, and the Orlando Silva is also a Congress man for the state of São Paulo. Mr. Zacarias Calil, Congress man for the state of Goiás, and Mrs. Maria Lucia Amari. 
state representative of the state of Sao Paulo. We also have Mr. Bruno Zambello, the state representative for the state of Sao Paulo. Here, I'd like to take the, uh, the, the opportunity to say that uh, Mr. Tomé Abdouche, who would take a seat at this event, unfortunately, couldn't be here today due to some health issues. We wish them wish him well and hope he has a full recovery soon. So I'd like again to thank you for all of you for being here. Now you can take your seats, please. I would like to, uh, to also greet those who are here. So please be aware of the time, okay? We're going to start. Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. I've been with you since the very first uh, edition of this event. Just it used to be about 100 people, and it's this huge right now, thanks to Tony, a real visionary and inspiration. And he was able to mobilize the scientific and political community, the uh, organized third sector, and we have people taking care of this population so intensely right now. I want to say hello to all of the federal deputies in the person of Jose Angelo Moro, all the state deputies in the person of Bruno Zambelli. Uh, I've been participating in these events about rare diseases for about 15 years. Uh, and after these meetings, we always hold public hearings to further the awareness about these diseases, which are so important, so we can minimize the suffering of this population, and they need us so badly. I just want to say, as a state representative, I want to continue to work, and I reinforce my commitment to make sure that everyone is entitled to their health. Uh, and I'll just to say how important our struggle is right now. Uh, we are working towards creating the hospital of the rare so that we can take care of the rare with the commitment and the obligation that we have to take care of the lives of the population and make the transformation that needs to be done uh, through our work. I'm really happy to be here. You can continue to rely on us in the Legislative Assembly of Sao Paulo. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Lucia and Maria. Bruno Zambelli, you have the floor. Oh, no. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. A brief introduction, right? One minute. I am a white man, brown hair. Uh, well, brown hair, but almost white. I have one meter, eight, five. I'm a heavy man. I discovered I'm not fat. I'm heavy. If I were two meters tall, I would probably be a bit leaner. I've been a politician for two years. Um, I've been working alongside Lucia Amari here, and the more we learn about politics, the more I realize I know nothing about politics, I just know people. Tony has been a friend in the backstage, he's a personal friend of my family's, so you can always count on us. Last year, uh, for New Year's, we tried an amendment for Casa Hunter, it came back because of document issues, but we are going to get that right. And at least this year, we are going to direct uh, a sum to finish making the hospital. You can count on Bruno Zambelli for anything you need. Thank you. Thank you so much. My dear houses, you have the floor. Yeah, you're kind of caught off guard, right? 
Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to extend my com compliments to the authorities here and especially to Tony, who has introduced me to this subject so responsibly and so carefully and being sure that you would achieve a response from the public sector. And that's what we've been doing. We've been participating in this scenario for many years and it's been growing and evolving increasingly more. We find increasingly more new people with this shared goal. And I was so happy to meet my friend, Rosangela Moro. We have put together the Parliamentary Front for Technology in Rare Health. I am the vice president, Rosangela Moro is the president, um, and we've been working really hard. Like you said, I'm going to give you some spoilers here. We are going to go around visiting states now, right, Rosangela? Rosangela is going to talk a bit more, but she was planning that with myself and Dr. Khalil for us to travel uh, and show every state how important this topic is. We have a lot of news to tell you here today, but we are going to leave it for the first round table because they're really important and we're going to talk about public policy for the rare. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. I am never missing any of the editions again of the scenario for public policy for the rare in Brazil and around the world now, because at each edition, we climb another step. We decide on things that we want to do and that we intend to do. So you can count on me in the federal House of Representatives. We now have Dr. Kalil. Rosangela and many other representatives were part of this front. Have a good morning. Great event to all of you. Pedro Westphalen, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, as a gaúcho, I want to thank you for the sensibility that is peculiar to you. This homage, this tribute to a state that's been suffering so hard, but that has awakened in Brazilians something that is very much ours, we, which is solidarity. All Brazilian states have reached out to Rio Grande do Sul to help, so thank you for this reminder of that. I want to say hello to representatives Calil, Maria Rosas, Rosângela, the big star today, doing exceptional work, state representatives or government, um, local government here represented. You've been doing great work to help the federal government too. But Casa Hunter and Tony have an outlook too. And I want to say hello to Febra Haras as well. And all of us who are the reason that we're here today. We are here with you authorities, both local, domestic and international, to do whatever little we can do that builds next to how, how much you deserve. Um, Tony succeeded in bringing parliament and the third sector together. And that is where society moves forward. Representatives are under no obligation to know everything. But through a parliamentary front with representative Rosangela Moro, is that we can inform people and discuss public policy that will make things happen for those who cannot wait. We are going to discuss that at the round table, but thank you for the honor of participating in this highly qualified roundtable and to speak in front of this great audience, which are patients of rare diseases. Thank you so much, Pedro Westphalen. It truly is a tragedy that happened down there, but 
know that you're not alone. We will stick with you for as long as it takes to rebuild. Rosângela Moro. Thank you. I'll briefly describe myself. Oh, thank you. Um, I am a 50 year old woman, dark hair, pulled back, long but pulled back uh, in a ponytail. I'm wearing a very light green suit, a white shirt and purple shoes. I am here standing next to people who are my family, as I usually say to Tony, my colleagues, uh, representatives doing amazing work at the House of Representatives, next to secretaries, representatives, uh, state deputies in front of this amazing audience. And I cannot refrain from saying that I am getting emotional because this is a full audience and it's beautiful. And we ran out of tickets to be here today. It's really beautiful. And you, you see that at each new edition, more and more people get involved. And once you are involved with this topic, you can't backtrack. And everything happened. Fernanda, I want to say a special hello to her, who alongside Tony started in this journey for personal reasons because of their son. And they transformed all of that in a North Star in a concern, a care for all rare diseases. People often ask, where do I go this disease? It, it has one other case across the world. I always say go to Casa Hunter. It is about treatment. It is about medication, but it is about care, empathy, embracing and taking care of people, which I see from Casa Hunter. And if you know my work, you know that Casa Hunter and several other entities in the third sector that have, uh, that I always recognize and they have the merit because if it were not for the advocacy work that all of these entities are doing, rare diseases wouldn't be a topic. 10 years ago, no one knew what a rare disease was, uh, how widespread they were. So it's a huge pleasure to be here once again. As long as I'm alive, I'll, I'll be here with you. You can count on me. Thank you. Zacarias Calil, you have the floor. Is this on? Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's a huge pleasure to be here. I'm also very proud to be here. I'd like to say hello to Tony and on behalf of him, all of the authorities who are present here. You might not be familiar with me. I am a representative for the second time. I am a pedi pediatric surgeon. I've never left that work. And I joined politics with the goal of improving the quality of life of people especially in my state, which is Goiás. We, ha we didn't have a pediatrics hospital un until then. Uh, um, I've been in medicine for 32 years, and my line of specialty brought me very close to rare diseases in pediatric pathologies and surgery. And we participate in several different Congresses, we present work, and with that, we were able to get a lot of uh, decisions made on behalf of patients. So now, I am, well, not me, my team, our team in Goiás, we are a reference, a world reference in separating joint twins. And I think there was a story on Fantástico, the Sunday show, about these pathologies. And we attract a lot of attention to rare diseases. And of course, now we have uh, a lot of work done with uh, 
vein malformation in children, which includes several rare pathologies. It's a very sensitive topic that we engage with and trying to improve the quality of life of those people. In Brazil, we have about 13 million people who are patients of rare diseases. Over 8,000 syndrome diagnoses. It's impossible for a doctor to know all of them. That's why we engage in this struggle in the House of Representatives so that we can have a reference center because we have our diagnosis takes five to ten years to be completed because early diagnosis is not done. And with the expansion of the heel brick test, we are now able to do early diagnosis. There are a few states which I'll name here. One moment, I just got the list. In order to get a diagnosis, you need a geneticist. In some states, like Amapá, Piauí, Rondônia, Roraima, and Tocantins, according to the Brazilian Society of Medical Genetics, there are no specialists. They're usually around here. So patients have to move, move back and forth doing a real peregrination, um, and that's why it takes so long to get a diagnosis. And when you get a late diagnosis, the disease is usually advanced and you can improve the, these people's quality of life as much as you could have. So politics is here for us to try and improve. I am the president of the mixed early childhood parliamentary front, which is the, that's zero to six years of age is the most important period in uh, in life for di early diagnosis. Um, and that's why we need to encourage the incorporation of medication to the public health care system, um, early diagnosis, training, so people have access to that. Politics is important in everyone's lives. We need to trust our politicians so that we can work seriously and honestly um, with the common good of the entire society as a goal. Raising awareness like we're doing with Global Play is really important in society. February 28th is the Worldwide Awareness of Rare Diseases Day. This is a moment where we need to participate, disseminate information, and call on our entire society to include these people who are patients of rare diseases. So we can, we could, at least in our state, disseminate our work at a world level. We have four episodes on Discovery Channel. They came here from England and did an amazing work. There is a case that we treated with, which is the werewolf syndrome. This child went many, many years with their entire body covered in hair. And with the laser device that we have in Goiás, which is the only one available in the public health care system, uh, it has no cure, but at least we were able to improve. When they looked themselves in the mirror, they couldn't believe it. They, they started crying. And it's one case in every one billion people born. So you can look it up online. You can see that episode. And we try to do our part as much as a struggle. Just to wrap up, I'm going to tell you just a quick fable here. There was a bird in a big forest that had burned down. It was a hummingbird. I don't know if you know hummingbirds, but most of you probably do. In that forest, the hummingbird would go there, grab a drop of water and throw it on the fire. And all the other animals were saying, are you insane? Or do you think you're going to be able to put, put out the fire? And the hummingbird said, at least I did my part. Have a good day, everyone, and a good, great event.
Serpa, a palavra é sua. Só vou pedir para se atentar ao tempo de um Mr. minuto. Mr. Mauricio, Serpa, you have the floor. Just uh, be aware of the time. You have one minute. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to greet on behalf of the President Tony, uh, all the authorities. It's a pleasure to represent the Secretariat and thank you for your sensibility. All the testimonials testimonies and we I, I, I mean what you managed to put together here putting to bringing together the society the Congress the executive power um, everything that you did is a uh, policy making what you do is a wonderful work and we are a uh, witness as partners and we came to us to build the first rare disease hospital in the world. And the counterpart is provide service to the population. I think that's that's a, the actual um, contribution. And I think for those who suffer from the rare disease, I'm not gonna extend much, but it's 65 cases by 100,000 uh, people. And that's the instance of a rare disease. And I just want to say that rare for me should be just a term. So the idea is to provide more information and congratulate to all for the event. Thank you, Mr. Mauricio Serpa. Ana Paula Nedavasca, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to do my auto description. I'm a blonde woman. I'm of a mid-size. Some people say I'm short, but average size. I have a, a shoulder-length hair. I have a blue uh, dress, and I'm wearing glasses. So it's a pleasure to be here. Events like that are crucial so that we can uh, we can make this uh, um topic more uh, to, to bring awareness to the topic. People are going to be have less prejudice if they know what we're talking about. So we are bringing together the society, patients, doctors, uh, public sector representatives. It's listening to all of you together that we can start thinking and prepare good pop, public policies. On behalf of my secretary, Secretary Marcos, um, I'm leaving my doors open with, so that we can work in partnership with all of you. I'm going to be here to learn. Thank you so much. Mr. Nathan Monsoris, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to thank Tony for the invitation once again. I'd like to create all participants on this table. Uh, my auto description, I'm wearing a gray suit. I have light skin. I'm wearing glasses. Um, on behalf of Ms. Janizia and the Secretary of uh, Specialized Attention for People with Rare Disease, the Coordination of Rare Disease um, Department, it's something new, but it's also very um, it's working hard, just like all the secretaries. So it's a very, um, the, the environment that we have today provide us a, 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 the right place for to have this sort of di dialogue and to have a better humanized and health ecosystem to everyone with rare disease or not. So I get open to questions right now. Uh, we have a democratic policies here. We have people uh, or participation here. We have people from all parts of the society, all stakeholders, and we are here to welcome people with rare disease and their caregivers. So thank you, Mr. Nathaniel Monsoris. Ms. Mrs. Dika Vidal, you have the floor. Tony, I'd like to greet all of you on behalf of Tony Fernando. I'd like to this, um couple who make us proud to be from the city of Sao Paulo and the state of Sao Paulo to have 
Casa Hunter headquarters here in Sao Paulo. I'm a white woman, I'm 170, I wear glasses, I have um, brown, straight hair. And now since I started working at the Secretariat, I have some gray hair as well. I'm wearing a white jacket, white skirt, and a pinkish um, skirt. And Tony, again, it's a pleasure to represent our secretary, secretary Silvia Greco, because we are about to receive an award for public policy for people with disabilities. She's in Korea right now, and probably on Wednesday we are going to find out if she, if we have received the award or not. So I hope she brings the award to us and to represent the mayor of Sao Paulo, who has a very inclusive outlook. I think Deputado Kalil mentioned the importance of looking at people, and the mayor uh, give us this lesson every day. You know what I'm talking about, right? What am I going to do today to improve the quality of life for all of our people? So in rare disease scenario, we last year in 2021, actually, we lost uh, Mayor Bruno Calvas to cancer, and he was already uh, negotiating with Tony to build this up. I think last year, Mayor Ricardo Nunes was here. Uh, we, we passed the bill and the city council, and now they are in the process of starting the construction. So you can count on us, Tony, Tony but with a uh, union that we have and joint efforts on this stage, uh, we can help you. I mean, people with disabilities don't have parties or political points of view, and people with rare disease neither. So I hope that soon we'll be able to launch this milestone to build this hospital that it's going to change lives. Um, me and Secretary Silvia, we had the opportunity to, to go to Porto Alegre and, and get to, and we got to see Casa dos Raros, your technology, and what we realized that we have to bring the cause to the spotlight. We have to try to devote, to, to bring awareness to this series. And once we know we cannot treat people differently, I mean, when you deal with people with disability, the first thing that you do is when you get to a space, you're going to say, okay, there is accessibility, there's a ramp. I'm the sister of someone with a disability, and I've never thought I'll have to fight so much for this cause. So we need all of you, we need to talk, we need to bring awareness, we need to bring powers together so we can have more assertive public, public policies and fast diagnostic. Uh, Fernanda, Tony, you can could have been living your life just with your son, looking to treat him, um, providing him a better quality of life. But no, you chose to uh, grow your family. And us from the Secretariat of People with Disability, we feel as part of this family. And I think that all of you who are with us online, you can, uh, you're going to feel you, 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 the contagion. You're gonna, you, you're gonna be um, overwhelmed by this feeling. And I, I, actually, I want to congratulate uh, and celebrate our Brazilian Sign Language uh, interpreters. Uh, here on the stage, we have Felipe and Joana, and online we have Amanda and Carolina. I'm gonna and with the secretary center that people with disability and rare disease should be loved, respected, and included. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dica Vidal. I'd like to invite all our guests to come here. Can we call people to the stage so we can have a very nice picture? If you guys can come to the front, thank you. I'd just like to ask you, for you who are here, to have this official um, picture taken. One quick second. 
Perfect. An applause. On behalf of Casa Hunter, I'd like to thank the authorities present here today, Tony, and everyone who's going to take part on the first roundtable. Uh, our dear authorities can take a step down. And Tony, you're going to moderate our first discussion today. You're going to go to the first roundtable for the ninth scenario of rare disease. Did you know that we have more than 300 bills that has something to do with rare disease? And the, like now, I mean, to be approved by Congress. And that's very important in terms of financing, uh, access to benefits, uh, awareness, and treatment. So now, to discuss all this topic, I'd like to invite the following guests to come to the stage. Mr. Leandro Fonseca, Head of Public Affairs and Healthcare Systems Sustainability at Novartis Brazil. An applause. And also Mr. Luis Enrique Castillo, the Director of Communications, Government Relations and Patient Advocacy at GSK. And our Congress members, Mrs. Maria Rosa, Rosangela Moro, Pedro Westphalen, and Zacarias Calil. Please uh, make yourself at home, take your seats. Tony? Tony? Tony, a partir de agora, a palavra Tony, é sua. From now on, you have the floor. Está faltando o deputado Zacarias, ele foi até o toalete, mas a gente... Uh, I think the deputado, uh, Congressman Zacarias uh, stepped out, but we are going to start. Well... Dear friends, once again, thank you so much for coming here today to take part of one more scenario of rare disease in Brazil. It's an honor, but before we start, I'd like to invite all of you to uh, watch a video sent by Senator Flavio Arns, and he sent it straight directly to our event. I'd like to congratulate, first of all, all of you who are participating in the event promoted by Casa Hunter. And tonight we are in the ninth decision to discuss the scenario and challenges and perspectives for rare disease in this country. First of all, I'd like to highlight uh, the motto, we exist to build answers. That's Casa Hunter's motto, and that's very important. We all together, work so that challenges are faced so that we have clarity and everything that we are going to discuss and public policies are taken for the human being's well-being. Challenges are great. They start with the diagnostic. Sometimes they are difficult to be done and they are hard to be it, it, hard to access these diagnostics, access to, to medication and treatment. Uh, we have a permanent discussion on uh, speed. How can we get the medication to the patient at the right time? Service, this multidisciplinary care that pe these patients require, support to families, research that must happen in Brazil. Uh, about all points of view, um, I think that we have the power to do genetic disease, uh, genetic research, as long as we have resources. Also, the possibility to improve uh, in situ care, for example, metabolic disease, for example, uh, we work together with them visa, we have a meeting with them after a public uh, hearing that adds flavors to the milk given to kids so that they don't have to be like quote unquote tied up to take 
the milk made available to them and that they throw up because of the taste. So everything should be accessible. Uh, we shouldn't have the need to judicialize issues. And with that, the Ministry of Health will spend more than one billion, and that's not necessary. And with that amount of money, we could meet all the needs of people with rare disease in Brazil, and at the same time, delaying treatment so that uh, children and families suffer, and they might miss the, the window of opportunity so that the uh, the, the recovery and and and, and full health can happen. I'm part of this debate. I'm at the Brazilian Senate, and I'm telling you, you can count on the Senate because we are together with families, people with rare disease. We are available for research professionals who work on rare disease to find answers to all these challenges. It's a long way to go, but it must be done together. We are together. Um, congratulations. We are going to build answers to all these great challenges that we have ahead of us. Hello. Hello, I'd like to thank you, Senator Fabio Arns, for your message. Uh, it's very important to have his engagement and in this agenda. So let's start. You've heard the figures, right? We have the more than 350 bills related to rare disease. Hundreds of propositions that indicate something very positive. No doubt about it. The rare disease agenda is no longer unknown. And this is very good. But on the other hand, the difficulty of access in diagnosis and treatment indicates that we still have important bottlenecks. I would like to start our conversation with Congresswoman Rosangela Moro, who at the end of last year launched a Makes parliamentary front on innovation and health technology for rare disease. With the approval and signature of 213 uh, Congress members from uh, Congress and the Senate. What will be the main movements of this front? And what can rare patients expect from this front? Thank you, Tony. One of the the first act on my mandate was to get the signatures from our colleagues to create the innovation and health and technology for people with rare disease. I count on the signature of all, all Congress people here. I have my vice president here. And the, our goal at the as Congressman Pedro said, we don't know everything. I'm not a doctor. So I need to have more technical knowledge, more specific knowledge from experts so that we can have public, public policies based on evidence, on figures, on data, technical knowledge. So that's why I brought together, put together this front. We are going towards six technical meeting. We are all invited July 10th, you're going to have one more meeting. This front is made of um, experts on the topic. We've studied this, this subject a lot. At the end of last year, Congressman Pedro did a huge work in Congress because it's hard. Uh, Deputy Congressman Zacharias to reach a tax that is a consensus and meet all the needs, always trying to uh, support the, the rights of researchers and patients. And he did this awesome work. So in this front with this uh, expert council, we could finally present 
an amendment in clinical trials. And also, we managed to we'll be able to present new projects or new bills. This front doesn't uh, talk about a specific disease. Our goal is to have uh, uh, um, the most common denominator from most of the disease as from our data are genetic, it's based on genetic uh, disease. We believe and we rely on clinical trials, trials that what put us in a privileged position and bring it together this front. We have a very important time. We must be uh, be really aware of the regulations and try to minimize uh, bad interpretation. Because at the end, if, if a technical body can participate in the regulation, we are going to open less margin to interpretation and we're going to be more reliable. This uh, Congress front, Tony, uh, did some research, number of law projects that uh, uh, it, it, waiting to be approved is huge. So we are trying to segment what is access, what is medication, uh, what can go through a public budget because it's a commission or a council. So if you don't depend on budget, what can we do? Counting on the support of our peers and colleagues, um, we have a lot of good projects, a lot of good bills. It doesn't matter to present new bills. We did a research. Um, we have a lot of of uh, of efforts to try to change the Brazilian public health system laws and access to to innovation technology. That's where we are right now. We, I managed to present some bills, but I'd like to highlight uh, a couple. First one, uh, I, I'm a lawyer, right? But I was working as a lawyer uh, together with associations and institutions. How we fought so much to have a seat at Connie Tech, because when you give this seat to the associations, we have so much information. It's inhuman to have the people that are trying to be represented to have a seat there. So we tried and we tried with relationships and talks. We weren't lucky. We weren't successful. The first projects or the first bills that I presented to Conitec, we have already approved them. So it's based on the CCJ. The governmental party, they came, uh, they become, they, they brought a kid to try to abstract, but we are going to try to pass this bill with our colleagues to try to build and, and write this text. We, we must discuss Casa Hunter and Febra Raras at Conitec. Once the, the disease are being discussed, uh, don't have a seat. We must have a seat when we have the disease being discussed. So I'm not going to take more of your time, but Tony mentioned uh, something. When you talk about neoplasias, the Brazilian health system, system has a law that says we have to start treatment within 65 days. We have her for cancer. Why not for a rare disease? Thank you so much, Tony, for taking part on this initiative because you're talking about public policies to be implemented. We have many rare disease. If I'm not mistaken, the Brazilian health system have around 60 uh, protocols for treatment. What we already have implemented, that's a public policy to been established. No discussion whatsoever. The federal government must comply. Now, why we have to wait for more than 65 days? I mean, we're not talking about something new, medication is in what stage of trial, it doesn't matter. We've, we've been through that already. There's a policy being that, that was implemented. And 
we are in a hurry because rare disease they leave the patient with with with, with equal so uh, another project that we managed to present is resources we presented the uh that the the, the lottery of prognostics part of it should be uh should be used in rare disease treatments it's something that we're trying to do the brazilian lottery um, there's another project to try to encourage health professionals to participate in continuous education. It's very important to have trained professionals. When the patient gets into the public health system door, so we must have uh, people, uh, people must have in mind that that can be a rare disease, but you must do that so that the health professionals are willing to do so. And how can we do that? Uh, we want to provide some benefits so that these professionals feel uh, that they are being valued, they are a valuable professional, like promotions. Um, for example, when there's a there's a tie, and that would be the the the, the decision making um, point. So I may have many projects, but I just wanted to highlight these few. And together with the Ministry of Education, we want rare disease to be part of uh, our, our medicine courses training. We want them to have a subject. Rare disease must be discussed in un the university. For those who are going to be trained as doctors, they need to know what they are. So not only doctors, but nurses and health professionals as a whole. So we're going to have our next event on the 10th, 17th, 18th of September. We're going to have another forum. I'd like to invite all the entities here in from Latin America. I had the opportunity to uh, meet and get to know some of them uh, during other events. So we must keep this debate going with a multidisciplinary discussion with a Congress, researchers, doctors, patients, uh, and together we can uh, progress. Thank you, Congresswoman Rosangela. Thank you so much for your support and your fight for us. So here we have two doctors that decided to take their medicine diploma to the Congress. One is Pedro Westphalen, who was the writer of one of the most important uh, projects, which is the PL697 from clinical trials. It was approved recently, but, it, but two items were vetoed. One of them is very important, that is the post-study. We all know those who follow our our fight that we managed to, to approve a resolution that limits the post study to five years for ultra rare disease research. And then after we had this this approval, Professor Robert Giuliani man from the University who managed to increase the amount of rare disease in a hundred percent from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty three. So life is a early access to rare disease trials. The earlier we do it, the better. With the veto from the president, if the Congress don't give an answer that the community expects, we will lose this progress. We are going back to zero. We're going to lose all investment that we had in, in research for rare disease. So I'd like to know from uh, Congressman Pedro, you were, you were the leader. How do you see what's going to, um, how are you going to face from now on? How can we veto this veto? First of all, I want to tell to, uh, Representative Rosanna that a uh, medical diploma is not enough. You need 
sensibility, you need wisdom, things that you have, Tony has. I am a doctor. I am the founder of the Federation of Hospitals from Rio Grande do Sul. But we always try to help technicians use our mandates to help people improve their quality of life. And I'm honored to be your colleague because of that. When we get to the parliament, I am on my sixth mandate for at a state level to at a federal level. In 2002, uh, we had a challenge in my state, and I took on that challenge. And there I saw that we could contribute greatly to make our mandates a, a means to hear people filter through things and seek paths, seek answers, like you said. I really like this topic. When I got to Parliament, I saw many, many projects, and I was like, more projects? Let's pick out a few that are really crucial. And it really called to me at the time that in Brazil, we had entrance diseases that were preventable through vaccines. And before COVID, I was furthering efforts for immunization, for measles, for children palsy. Um, and it was really an extraordinary response. And then for COVID, I was a front man for the provisory measure that brought the vaccine to Brazil. And I saw one of those projects, clinical research from Ana Amelia Lemos in 2017. And it was just stuck there. I was like, this can't be here. If you have cancer, you're in a rush. If you have a rare disease, you're in a rush. And I was in Baltimore in the US at the Hopkins Hospital. And I saw two Brazilian researchers who were, were lecturing us on clinical research. And one of them, a gaúcha, was crying because she had to leave the country to conduct research that couldn't be started here. And we have to further that. I talked to everyone, the government at the time, the industry, parliamentary uh, representatives, we advanced, we had setbacks, because you have to seek the best possible outcome, what is possible, and then what is accomplishable. And we were able to further that measure approved by the Federal um, House of Representatives, removing the restraint from early clinical research. And we were able to do that with the help of parliamentary representatives. Um, the help of Representative Hosanna was crucial. And there were a lot of restraints. I asked her to remove them because amendments will hinder the progress of this project. Sometimes by removing a few restraints, we are able to move forward faster. Um, and that was with Hosanna Maria de Kali, which is a real icon for us at the Senate. And then when once it went to the Senate, I asked um, the representative to front that effort. The federal government was really helpful at first, without question. We have to understand um, that they will understand and be helpful now, too because the research that isn't conducted here because of those restraints that we have in all fronts makes that research be done outside the country. I saw the girl from Rio Grande do Sul cry abroad because she had to leave the country to conduct research. All that research that would take five million years in the first year will be taken out of here in a multiracial continental country. We have Africans, we have indigenous people. I am German and Italian originally. We have the Arabs, you have 
all possible audiences for you to research that you might want. And it was really something extraordinary. Uh, we discussed, we understood each other, we went back and forth. It was pushed forward in the Senate as well, and quickly too. And then we were able to shorten the period for research to start to 30 days, the health inspection for 15 days. And we are going to do that in Parliament, and you, the people with rare diseases, are going to help us sensibilize representatives to your situation, and I'm sure the government will see that. It, it's not going to be obstructed, because that would prevent investment to be done in research. It would prevent our hospitals, and I am the president of the Parliamentary Front in Defense of Healthcare Services. And those people want to do research. They need to do research. So this is a set of factors that leads us to need to sensibilize the National Congress. And all of us together, I think, can help f further this advance in Brazilian research, perhaps the best we had recently. We have our health public health care system which really needs that and i'm a huge defender of it and we need to approve that project to engage in the structural change in brazil I am much, feel much more assured we really need to take down that veto to make sure research continues for all the rare in our country. Dr. Zacarias Kalil, our second doctor in this valuable group, one of the bills Um, the author is Rosangela Moro, right, which is PL 2110, for treatment in cases of suspected or identified rare diseases. And it is much more than making people alert of how urgent rare diseases are. It's an effort to create an ecosystem for them, uh, to have a better flow, uh, an ecosystem that is sustainable, of course, which uh, is one of our aims. My question for you is, how can we accelerate the transformation of the public machine to make the required change changes to the new medicine, which is precision medicine, which is knocking at the door now. Well, this is a very um, pungent response. It's important to know that current medicine and the medicine of the future will require many changes for us to meet the population's needs. I see this as very important because I was to Denmark and despite having 6 million inhabitants, let me just turn this off, sorry. It is a completely digitized country, the most in the world. And they have full control of their patients. So, for example, when you're born, you have their um, tax ID, which is called a CPE. They include that in your health system. You can change doctors, cities. Wherever you are, they will know your history. Unfortunately, here in Brazil, the Ministry of Health does not have a long-term planning policy. It should be at least 30 years. As soon as you change governments, everything changes. We don't have a adequate control. The states don't speak to each other. We don't know who is in Minas or in Rio Grande do Sul. We should have 
an electronic control system where we could access all of our patients. Now we were able to approve um, a change in the Board of Medicine, uh, but for that we need the Internet. 5G is being implemented throughout the country. Uh, our government had Conecta Brasil, which was a project that would grant everyone access to the Internet, which is really, really important. Something else is we need to improve medicine courses. We're champions in medicine courses in the world. The quality has decreased. We we're only losing to India in numbers, but you see this indiscriminate prolification of universities. And students are not taking the classes that they need to take. They're not finding hospitals to work for. And it's important to mention that. Something else that Pedro mentioned was Johns Hopkins. I was there with him, and I was fascinated by the research there. Uh, us doctors were fascinated by research. And they're not concerned with surgery. They have 80 surgery, surgery uh, rooms. Everyone is working with that. That's not a concern. And he talked about that Brazilian who's a veterinarian and she's working in, she's working on uh, pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals using cannabidiol as therapy. So they're the very first in the world in research because everything that involves research, innovation, technology, and, and that's what it is. It's innovation. We need to innovate because a country that owns patents is ahead of everyone. You see China, Japan, they'll create pa patents in a year. will take 10 years. By the time you create the patent, the period for new medications is expired. So we need research that will promote research advancements. I am very passionate about early childhood. People think the early childhood is when the child is born. But no, the early childhood starts at conception and it goes to six years old. So that's where you can conduct diagnosis, early diagnosis, so that we can treat. Of course, we need good resource manager, uh, good stock management. We need to debureaucratize service in public hospitals, for example, something that could be significantly improved is the efficacy and quality of the service that is provided. We need to implement public initiatives like regulation and financing of the public health system, um, fiscal incentives, and including new medication in SUS and financing research. I was looking at my phone, but it wasn't just anything. I was doing research with my um, team in Brasilia to see how many ju judicialization processes we have in the country for medications. She told me that that, that is secret information. So you see, we have at least 70 cases that are judicialized with uh, medication registry. So that's tricky. Reference centers for rare diseases, like the ones we've been um, attempting to build. Land was donated by the government, and we need to encourage our mayors to do that, like we have in other states, because with amendments by representatives that are supporting the cause, we can do a lot of partnerships with the universities and research centers to enhance diagnosis and treatment. We have a specialty center in Goiás, 
and it works inside the Federal University of Goyaz, and they're very involved with that. The Genome Project which came from the previous government, and we've been working with that. The Genome Project is really important. You need to understand that it's crucial being able to do diagnosis based on um, your genes. This is a future project that's really important. And that can be advanced through public-private partnerships. That's really important, too. So incorporating advanced technologies like um, artificial intelligence, which I think is the very cutting edge, biomedicine, other devices can improve uh, the diagnosis and treatment of these diseases. Supplementary alternatives and alternatives that can pro promote more holistic um, treatments for patients, developing collaborative research with international institutions. And raising awareness, which is what we're doing today, and celebrating that uh, the, on February 28th. Which, which I know you, you've been working very hard on. And also continuously updating healthcare professionals with the latest discoveries so that we can create medication that is more effective. You just mentioned something that goes for a full manual for a bill that aims at a national system to identify and treat rare diseases because you mentioned capacitation, financing. You talked about how to face that, having appropriate reference centers because it's no good if you have a reference center that has a five-year waiting line. You can't wait five years for an early di for your first diagnosis. You know that that is criminal with rare diseases, knowing that 30% of them die before five years of age. About surgery, I really liked what you said, because as soon as we start focusing on innovation and research, um, without focusing on surgery, uh, people here like surgery a lot, you know. Uh, I can get a robot to do that in a few years, we'll be able to do that. But innovation is not car carried out by robots. It has to be done by a human brain, which is how we'll think of increasing access to new treatments. And I have to think of government and sustainability to do that too. That's why it is, we need an ecosystem that will discuss and work together. Thank you, Representative, for your, um, for your words. And that's why we're here. We have a lot of projects now, and we need to extract what is necessary from them and add what hasn't been added yet. And I'll go back to something that you said. Uh, Representative Maria Rosa was proactive in that sense in December. Last year, she was advancing the project that will include questions related to rare diseases and demographic uh, censuses. And that's never been done before. And there is a project to include diabetes. Uh, we need to know how many diabetics we have in the country. We don't know? No. It's important to include those things. Well, since the government needs predictability, have appropriate budgets. In order to do that, they need to understand how all of those diseases inside that they need to treat. So, since you have stated, uh, as you have stated, the goal is to extract this group of Brazilians from the shadows, from invisibility. And I want to know how your administration wants to work with 
the implementation of that law with the appropriate authorities like the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics and how what you expect to come out of raising those numbers okay Tony I'll do a brief self description because it's important to remember uh, blind and hind of hearing people who are watching us online too I am Maria Rosas I am a light-skinned brown woman I am 55 years old I have brown hair uh, shoulder length hair I'm wearing a white striped blazer with black shirt and trousers and I am sitting at that table which is very um, a huge honor to me because we each have our seat of participation I really like data because I am a professor and a defender of education and I want to immediately congratulate you on your comic which was done in partnership with Maurício de Souza and it's being distributed at schools and it is about what rare diseases are in a fun uh, didactic way and it's really important for us to reach every area because research is also related to education with universities and looking at the numbers everyone always says oh we have these million people with rare diseases in Brazil six million people 15 million people and I'm like where did you get that information where can we know where those people are what they need and no one can tell me and there was a project in the House of Representatives when we say that there are 350 projects it's we do have a lot of them but we need to find the ones that are going to have an effect in practice in people's lives their family members lives and having that practice will make a difference in people's lives not just oh we have a project we have a project projects don't make a difference in people's lives implementation does and that's why we're sitting at a round table for public policy that's what is a defense of the public interest and when I had this project to front I was so honored I was like I, I believe in this project and we are going to get it approved and that was the case we started working with that project so that it was so that rare people were included in the IBG the Institute for Geography and Statistics it was approved in the House of Representatives now it's in the Senate and to answer your question we my team wants to follow through on that by following up on its approval in the Senate all the way through so this project was done at the House of Representatives but it goes on there is a whole process for it to be approved in the Senate just as it, it is with clinical research and now the Senate is also going to vote on that and I would just like to quickly talk about what this project is going to ensure it will ensure uh, attention to health project programs um, financial support for research which is really important because as soon as we know where people with rare diseases are where they live which states have the most of them look how important that is we can also get financial support for research support for people with rare diseases and their families that's included in the project in the bill federal and state level um, apports 
because we were doing we were including things in that we took advantage of us being at the forefront of this project uh, and this bill to include more aspects in the bill and I would encourage you if you're watching this lecture this scenario both in person and online that you put in your request in the Senate for this project this bill it was number 4559 uh, of 2016 but it needs to be supported by the population I am honored to also be the co-author of the statute for people with rare diseases we also didn't have one and this statute is now at the Commission for People with uh, Disabilities, for which I am a member, uh, one of the main members, and also in the health and education front. And that way we can close all the gaps for education, for health, and people with disabilities. And I want you to rely on me both to disseminate information to defend and to file these bills which are so so important for for the lives of people with rare diseases we also have the national policy um, we're working on that bill right now it's been through several commissions and it is going to be voted soon we really do need to watch those projects uh, those bills so that they have visibility and results. One other important bill is one that anticipates treatment after the results of the Hillbrook test uh, comes out to include rare diseases. Because in the Hillbrook test, you can detect a rare disease, but the time is of the essence at that point. So we need to anticipate treatment to as soon as those diseases are detected. We need to pay special attention at that point to people with rare diseases. We also have supplementary health for treating rare people. Uh, it is going to be a struggle, but I rely on Tony, Rosangela, and everyone here to include rare people in healthcare health insurance we do need that attention we're not afraid of that struggle because it is so valuable and so important and it is going to meet the needs of millions and millions of people so you can rely on the fighters who are here ready to fight for the good cause congratulations representative thank you so much I'm getting a lot of questions here from the people who are watching online I'll try and pick out a few um, for the end of the conversation. But right now, we have started this scenario by talking about public policy with our representatives, but we also have two representatives of pharmaceutical companies. Leander Fonseca, you are at the forefront of the Novartis uh, public policy and sustainability sector. What are some critical points that you still identify when we talk about rare diseases? Where are the bottlenecks, would you say? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Tony, for your invite to be here. I want to say hello to everyone in the panel, and especially patients and patients' families who are um, in here and watching us from home. First, a brief self-description. I am male, 50 years old. 1 meter, 80 centimeters, 75 kilos, gray hair, and a beard. According to my nine-year-old daughter, I am good-looking, but this is by no means a consensus. At first, looking at your description and understanding here as a representative of the pharmaceutical company, uh, there might be bias in what I say, just like my daughter has her biases as well. 
I think it's just important to highlight where I'm coming from. But I'm, I, I am also adding uh, 16 years of public office. I worked in the Treasury Ministry and the Health Ministry. So being here in a public health panel uh, representing a pharmaceutical company but going uh, discussing public policy and in that sense I want to highlight the work of those to improve public, public policies for these patients and also the role of supervising and inspecting the government in order to check whether they are uh, implementing the decisions that have already be, been taken or that need to be taken, those that still need to be taken. I mean, like to to give you a concrete example, Congressman Kalil mentioned the judicialization, judicialization of patients with um, spinal uh, neoplasia. So some are those appeals that the families uh, need to go through because the, pro the government decides to incorporate that product in December 2022 and one year and a half, it's still not uh, enforced or made available. So we are all against judicialization. It's not the best uh, form to the best way to provide assistance to health. But unfortunately, um, that's what you have to do. I mean, we, we don't have the answer. That's the, 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 the decision of incorporating something that in practice it's still not there for the patients. So I'd like to thank the Congress members who are engaged in this cause and the, the, this new this spinal atrophy disease. We have some initiatives. Um, we have some discussion in terms of speeding up the neonatal screening task because those with rare disease, they are in a hurry. We need to speed up diagnosis. And the policy determines a, 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 a lead time. But we can see very clearly that uh, some states, it, it was made available for the states to speed up this process of incorporating um, other disease to be included in the neonatal screening test. And we have to see who has political uh, disposition. Because some states have sped up and uh, in some respective states. So this political willingness that we demand, I mean, the society demands that. And Congress, which represents the people listening to what the society uh, has to say, is trying to uh, vocalize. And I'm just adding to other Congress people, Congress members present. So regarding your question, Tony, what we can see is some of the judicialization and difficulties for access when we talk about rare disease, they happen due to the lack of a budget solution. We still don't have a budget solution uh, for that. We have a national policy established through uh, a bill that they still need to, to take that and make it turn into a, a, a law, not only a rule, and so to make this a, po a positive sign that we, that, because today we don't have a budget solution that uh, make the access uh, to possible for patients. So some of the decisions are made judicially. 
and the access is then not the more appropriate one for this population. So I think it's a very important point. We need to discuss that to have this budget solution that will allow access, uh, timely access to access to health. So thank you so much, Leandro. And I think to get to this point so that we can have this appropriate budget and financing, we need to have a plan. And if you don't have it, if you don't have a plan, if we don't have the budget, so how can I finance something that I know how much it's going to cost? I cannot finance a disease. I need to finance all disease. I need the center that responds correctly to the ministry that somehow naturally they can follow up with patients, uh, receive uh, or, or pass on the results to the agency, either the Anvisa or the government that incorporated the, 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 that certain treatment or medication in the public health system. We need a, a broader plan. Um, especially for for rare disease because once we once we have an annual budget to face or a correct management plan for rare disease in the country now uh, let's go to Ru Ruiz Enrique, the director for government affairs uh, i'd like to go further in some of the topics we've discussed before uh, thinking about uh, the 10 years that we have this rule from 2014, we mentioned that the law project can be divided into or break down into different topics, benefits, access to diagnosis, treatments, and all issues related to financing and funding. When you think about uh, rare disease and public policy, what are the topics that are still missing? They still have gaps that must be considered in new bills. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tony. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to sit at this table. It's such a noble discussion. I think that it's important to all of us here, for me as a Brazilian, and I think that's the greatest point. When you think about 10 years, Tony, uh, Congresswoman Rosangela brought some important um, points that we have more 250 bills that have been uh, submitted that, and that, that they, 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 they are related to rare disease in every, uh, every part of the, the journey of the patient. So we have different proposals and we need to do exactly what you are doing now to do uh, a, a screening, like a, a, a huge screening on all bills that are being submitted to understand what needs to be done and what goes beyond what we are already assessing. The creation of a national policy is very relevant. We've seen this movement for different diseases, like an oncology. They went through a very interesting, uh, a very interesting movement in going through this screening and what else we could do. But uh, there's a topic that really draws my attention, which is that what we include in access, which is incorporation. Here, I represent GSK. GSK is a British pharmaceutical multinational company more than 100 years in Brazil. And we have the five largest pharmaceutical companies in the world that inf in terms of investment in research and development. So investment in research and development is there. Of course, more and more we need to increase this volume and investment flow. But when you think about a patient and access to medication in terms of a process of incorporation, we have a huge bottleneck. When you look at the world and Brazil, and here is where we have to act, act more uh, 
more strongly. We have a bill and that brings some light to what we call uh, access innovative programs, and that's shared risk. We've heard, we all heard of that. When we look at this law project, this bill, and we can see that Brazil is way behind other countries that in terms of rare disease, not only in rare disease, but also oncology and other rare disease, they generate an impact, especially thinking of what you just said, which is sustainability. Uh, this is a very important point. How can we implement, how can we incorporate in, in, increasing access to the patient on one end, but I am the owner of the molecule, right? And I can provide the government some uh, security that what I have in my clinical trial is going to be respected and now it's going to bear the the, the the burden of the outcome, whether they're good or bad. So at the end of the day, they're not measuring the the account. They are measuring how much you manage to reach the page, the patient, following a proposal. And, and I am the best mechanism in terms of who can access, who can provide this information to the government and bring this information to life. And together, we manage to build a solution. And that's a very important point. But once again, us as GSK, and that's our pillar, it doesn't matter if we invest billions of British pounds in research and development, if the patient on the other end cannot benefit from this technology. That in Brazil, unfortunately, part of the patient are, they, 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 they fall into this gap. And the patient is, we, we can see that he's not accessing to, to uh, um, a bottleneck in the system. So thank you, Luis. It's not easy for uh, Congress members. We have different projects, different commissions. If you don't know the day-to-day -day work, do you only propose uh, a bill and you're going to approve this tomorrow? No, it doesn't work that way. And you go to Senate once it's approved by the by the Congress, and then it goes back to the Congress, and we're going to spend years before it's uh, salvaged or rescued. That's why we need to work together. We must have a multi-dimensional uh, work so it can be approved fast. We need it to be well put together so that we uh, we have some, some questions here. And if you want to answer, please feel free. First question comes to from Edna Barbosa, and she's saying, I live in Sao Paulo and I have a rare disease. Where can I be? Uh, uh, where can I receive my service? And not, am I going to have a multidisciplinary uh, service? Well, today we have a treatment not in our not in the city. So if they have a disease, they go to a different state. They will go through a regulatory system, and this system has some reference on what it, where can it go. But if they are from Sao Paulo, and they, she wants to be uh, receive service in Sao Paulo, is it going to happen to a multidisciplinary? Uh, the system will be prepared for that, but it will depend on the unity where you're going to providing this treatment. Universities, uh, school hospitals, wherever you have a multidisciplinary team, usually the universities are prepared for that, in theory. But we go through different uh, unities. Uh, but it's interesting, Tony, because unfortunately, in the case of rare disease, we treat symptoms. We don't really treat the cause. 
in our system and to go through this multidisciplinary team is going to take uh, some time and we don't do this management plan a uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach and that's why we want to have the hospital and so that it can be more effective and faster and and shorten the patient's journey. Through our mo model, we want to have the most 10 weeks for the management plan. Do we manage to do that in Porto Alegre? We brought down the time for diagnostics to less than 60 days. Is it possible if we, I mean, we are still working, but it will take longer for us to get there. Yeah. What I'm going to say, I will tell them, go to Casa Hunter. I didn't want to say that. That's a great, a great beginning. Yes, they can come to Casa Hunter. We have the Day Hunter, which is a multidisciplinary team. It's a long way to go. But unfortunately, some states don't have that. We are lucky to have four. But there are some states where they don't have this possibility. So we, we need to broaden these aspects. And Sao Paulo managed to receive and serve, uh, provide service to different uh, parts of the country, not only the state of Sao Paulo. I would say go for Casa Hunter. But here, in the city, I, I'm a congressman for the state of Sao Paulo, and we have the the University Hospital, I was surprised, and I was happily surprised to see that we have a research center related to rare disease. Now, soon, we are going to have a hospital ready, especially in terms of uh, providing service for these people on the short run, and that's our goal. Uh, thank you, uh, and I'm going to tell Edna, go to Casa Hunter. We have a partnership with CSMD. The Day Hunter work that once a week, a, a medical team, a non-medical team, uh, will see the patients with rare disease with their uh, caregivers, because unfortunately the caregiver, especially the, the female caregiver, 99.9%, 100%, they are women. They come to us sicker than the patient. So we are here to provide them this service. Another question from Edna is, how can I link my rare disease with the national health system um, protocols or, or to be included in their list of, of treatments and disease. Dr. Alexandre can answer this later on. Uh, she needs to talk closer to the mic, otherwise we cannot translate. We don't want to judicialize it. So the, this is uh, ANS, is the regulatory agent, and it receives public and political pressure to broaden this list. And the second is for the federal go federal police. So or the, actually the, the Brazilian IRS, if you is a carrier of a rare disease before we required administrative document. And when you present your, your tax returns, you're going to have the tax exemption. So we'll fill out when you do your tax returns every year. But before that, we are going to have uh, the administrative procedure where you're going to show the doctor's opinion, uh, showing that you do have the disease. Uh, questions from Sabiani Mota. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fabiani Mota. I'm a nutritionist, a dietitian, and I like to know how public policies are being structured. 
to meet the needs of nutrition, the nutritional needs of people with rare disease, more specifically uh, in the uh, areas that are hard to reach, like the remote areas in Brazil. Can I answer this question? With this concern related to people in the autism spectrum, they select the, the, the food. We started the project so that we could implement the nutritional, the nutritional issue in there in the therapy in, 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 in therapies for these patients. It went through the judicial, uh, the legal system. Now they moved this view to the Senate, and there we include for for the Senate we included the rare disease. In health, we have two very uh, important points, which is access, quality, and funding. Those are the main topics that we have to go through when we talk about public uh, success, successful public policies. It's crucial that we have a diagnostic center like we have in Porto Alegre, Casa Hunter, which is awesome. Governments need to focus in understanding more and more that this patient needs to have uh, early access to diagnostic. And we have three things that change the world. Drinking water, antibiotics, and vaccine. If you have the antibiotics, but you don't have the disease, what's, what is it there for? Same thing happens for rare disease. We need to multiply qualified centers to have these early diagnostics of pathologies so that the patients can have access to them. A patient in Sao Paulo asked me, where should we should go in Sao Paulo? We need information. It's from here. This information should be out there. The government must be more proactive, understand. And I don't think we don't have money. I think the money must be better applied so that we can have all the results in terms of investment that GSK is doing and other industries are doing to bring uh, uh, health to most vulnerable populations. Uh, like for, for us who are watching us and who wants to know where we are going to have a multi-professional a service. Before Casa dos Raros in Porto Alegre, we have Day Hunter in Sao Paulo, we have Day Hunter in Goiânia at the University Hospital. We have in Bahia at the Bahia School in Salvador and, and another one in Rio. In Paraíba as well, yes, in João Pessoa. Now, I'm going to pass the floor to Dr. Nathan. I'm just going to help, okay, so uh, that the person who asked can get some uh, north. We have Minas, you have Santo André, San Jose do Rio Pedro, there, Ribeirão Preto, and one more. Vanya is here, Ribeirão Preto is the other city. On the Ministry of Health website, there's a specific page for rare disease. That's one of the first work that we did, and we have all the information, including multidisciplinary service. For those who are watching us, you can Google rare disease, Ministry of Health Brazil. You can find the information and contact. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. Well, we are getting closer to the end of this meeting, but we need to have a very, we need to discuss a very concerning uh, subject. Law and law practice. Here I have one of the final questions that we're going to, Leah, who was with me on the phone, she sent me a question that has a lot to do with the one that I was going to ask. Law 1454 that expands to more than 50 the number of disease is screened by the neonatal screen test. Uh, this law is three years old, but it hasn't been enforced yet. The, go the Congress did their job in putting pressure to approve the document. Now the 
the document are the document is on the hands of the executive to uh, implement it. Now, as you can see, academia and Congress then work together to implement this law. This law is so important for patients with rare disease. All of you are invited to answer this question. How the civil society, industry, academia, and Congress legislative power can work together to implement this new law? I've participated very actively in this bill to expand the neonatal screening test. We did a lot of work to bring awareness in Congress. It was approved. It wasn't easy. We had a lot of meetings with the Ministry of Health, and we managed to find some conciliatory terms. It went to the Senate. Now it's already a law. We need to implement it. But we need to join our forces because we referred it to the Ministry of Health. We asked it to be implemented. We have the need that states and municipalities are ready with political willingness to implement. Some states, they are already doing that. Brazilia has done that, another state as well. Sao Paulo has done that. And Paraná has done that. So we actually need political willingness from the state government and municipalities, especially the state. It's a law, and being a law, we need to understand and implement. The executive now has this homework, but we are there working so that soon we can have no state the neonatal screening test, the expanded neonatal screening test, so that we can have the an early diagnostic, and with that we can go through the whole journey of treatment and referrals. If you don't do the early screening test, we cannot know how is it, uh, how it's been done or how, how people are doing them uh, and, and, and how much, how many, right? So we built together this report with Dr. Mariana. Well, that time was a congressperson. We ran a lot, but we managed to advance. And now it's a law. Now we need to enforce this law. So we need political willingness to implement this law. If I can add to this debate, the law was really well done in terms of establishing a a federal uh, target, so but also authorizes states to implement it uh, faster. So question is, what can we do? And I think one of the things that we can do here is to value those who started first, those who uh, show this, demonstrated this political willingness. And I think that is something that we can do, which is, I value those who are willing to implement the law and also uh, have the, the calls from the civil society and the representatives in Congress so that we can advance at a federal level all over the country, reaching the whole population. Tony, that's something that I think is important. Um, the industrial sector has the role of education. And with capillary, with our capillarity, we can reach most of the regions. Now, question is how us as industry can cooperate because many of them are lost. They don't know what to do. They know there's a law and they don't know how to implement it. Then industry together with the civil society and Congress members, we have this possibility of collaborating actively together with, of course, in the beginning, we're going to uh, do pilots. 
but we can bring that to the surface and we can make sure that the policies are implemented at the patient's end. So to have a, we do have a role here. Of course, it's important to, to, to encourage this to happen, but we can help as well. That's how we can help with our medical team. We do have a qualified team um, together with the work that we do with the civil society. When I got here, I saw a video of a kid who was early diagnostic, uh, who, who received the early diagnostic, and with a kid that didn't receive the early diagnostic. That says everything. It's to bring awareness that if you have the right diagnostic, we have, we, we, we put together the treatment that we have available. And I mean, us from the Congress, government, state municipality and federal, this video should be seen by everyone. It's a normal person uh, touching a, a, a kid and a, 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 with tenderness to a, a baby that didn't receive the early diagnostic and gonna be suffering from their rare disease. So we must be sensible to try to reach where we need to reach with early diagnostics. Thank you so much on behalf of Casa Hunter. I would like to thank you all for your support as well as your partnership and to be here once more with us. And we're gonna to be together in this partnership and really help better, be, to be able to help our patients better. So thank you, Tony. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm gonna ask you all to be here, get close to me so we can take the official picture of our first round table. Can you come here to the front so you can take a, the official picture? Guys, just a quick second, because, of course, this meeting brings very important points to be taken into account in proposing new laws and leading um, key issues to the rarely disease. Behind me, you're going to see the QR code. Okay, you're going to take the picture and then you're going to see the QR code on the screen. Now, please let me send you a quick message. Have the pictures. Great. Let's start with the QR code. You can scan it and you can assess this first round table. We prepared a quick survey and it's crucial for us to improve our events. Guys, can you step to the side so people can scan the QR code, please? Step aside so they can scan the QR code. Okay, we came to the end of this morning's plan, but just a quick, quick second before you leave. When you go to the theater, there is a thematic exhibition for the newest Casa Hunter campaign. Uh, please check it out. The stars are the reason we are here, our patients and caregivers. So take this opportunity because you're going to have a, a lunch break. We'll be back at 1.30. So uh, be on time so we can carry on with our program. Thank you so much and have a good lunch.